is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. off the puzzle. Oh. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. I would like to welcome to the Sub-70 podcast, two-time web.com winner and current Champions Tour player, Tommy Tolls of the podcast. Tommy, thanks for taking the time today to, uh, to be on the podcast and spend some time with us. No, my pleasure. Well, first off, it was, uh, it was a pleasure to meet you this week out at the uh, Senior Players Championship at Exmoor. Got to watch you on the driving range. It looks like you're swinging at it quite well. How's your game feeling right now? Um, seem to be a pretty good place in the tournament. Are you working on anything, or where are you at sort of overall, and what do you think is going to happen over the weekend here? Well, I'm always, uh, always working on everything. You know, it's, it's never perfect. Sometimes, sometimes it's better than, uh, better than it could be. Sometimes it's never good enough. So um, I think, you know, our games are always evolving. Our brains are always inferior. <laughs> so most most of the time it's you know between our ears and we're going to mess things up uh, you know, we're all kind of ingrained you know fairly consistent day to day but uh you know our uh mental capacity or whatever seems to be limited or at least mine anyway well you're six under par t17 two pretty solid rounds um do you have a score maybe in your head over the weekend of what you're going to have to to get to do you have to play a little bit more aggressive or do you think the course might firm up and kind of come back a little bit since it is a major championship this week uh, I would like to think that they're going to firm it up. The conditions right now are really soft. You know, if you're hitting a long iron into the green, it's holding, you know, in the typical major fashion, you know, majority of the time it's near impossible to uh, to land a long iron on the green and keep it on the green. You know, a lot of times you have to either navigate or negotiate, you know, how it, how it gets there. But, uh, you know, Exmoor is kind of yielding it right now and, you know, it's a little breezy out here at the moment, but the the winds really have never stayed up for an entire day since we've been here this week. You know, they might be a little dust here and there in the morning, but it lays down in the afternoon, sometimes vice versa. But, uh, you know, I just, I would, I, would, I, would, I would like to see the conditions firm up a little bit, but I, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. We were out there, like I said, on Tuesday. What a beautiful golf course, uh, classic Donald Ross design, some beautiful green complexes. Do you like those classic sort of golf courses, and, and what sort of your – does does Exmoor fit your eye? Is it something you're comfortable playing? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable here. Um, I, I, do, I do like the older styles um, and the fact that, you know, more often than not, it's, it's a golf course confined to uh, the, the, the boundaries – um, the exterior boundaries of, of the golf course itself, you know, a lot of day, a lot of new construction these days, you know, that Nicholas and Fazio and Core Crenshaw do, you know, they build courses that are cut out in between homes. You know, obviously this, you know, they're trying to sell property, you know, beyond, uh, beyond the scope of the golf course, which is, you know, it's understandable, but to me, it, you know, anytime you have home sites attached to that or whatever, you kind of just disturb the eye a little bit as far as, um, you know, what a golf course should look like. You know, this, this place is just boxed in by a fence with a bunch of uh, trees around the edge of it. And, you know, it's been here for over a hundred years and, you know, mother nature has modified it a little bit. There's, you know, obviously been some tweaking done to Donald's original design, but for the most part, it's about as classic as a golf course as you'll ever find. Yeah. I, I've, I've been lucky enough to play it before, but just the way it was set up for the tournament when we were out there, I thought it just looked, it presented itself beautifully. I mean, we saw the same things. The greens were kind of soft, but, what a what a cool thing for you guys on the Champions Tour to go play such a classic, iconic Donald Ross golf course. And I know from growing up around the Chicagoland area, it's one of the it's regarded as one of the better tracks in the North Shore. Not that there's not a lot of really great golf courses in that part of Chicago, but it, it's cool to see a major kind of come to Exmoor and kind of show off for how good it is. So it's been it was fun to go out there and, and kind of see it getting ready for this level of championship. For sure, I wish uh, I wish there were, wish there were venues like this every week. Yes, exactly. Right, like you can just you can feel that it's old, and I love golden age architecture, and it's I thought it lived up. They presented the golf course beautifully for the level of championship as, that's out there this week. So, my follow up to that of, of having like a you know in a major, does your week change based on the Champions Tour that it's a major champion? 
chip out there? Does your does your focus, the prep work, is, or is it like every other week that's basically out there? Or do you put a is there a little extra emphasis this week because it is a major championship? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, I've, I've heard that a lot from other players. You know, you know Tiger back in you know when he first started, you know, and had you know had his success and was winning you know five, six, seven, eight tournaments a year. You know that he wanted to limit his schedule more so that he could focus more on the majors. You know, he felt like. If he was going to make a run at Nicholas's record of thirty something majors, you know that, you know he was going to have to miss a few tournaments around those tournaments to in order to prepare himself. And you know I never quite could understand that mentality. You know, that, of course that's coming from a guy you know that would you know was winning seven or eight tournaments a year. And you know I'm a guy that's you know most of the time is not winning anything. So, um, but you know to to tell your to tell yourself and to tell the media and to tell the public that. You know, I, I want to focus more on everything else. You know, a regular tournament just doesn't mean as much to me as, as anything. And I, I would think anytime you put a, a peg in the ground, it should mean something. You know, whether you're out there playing in a pro-am group or whether you're playing with your, your dad or whether you're playing with, with friends or, you know, whether you tee it up in a tournament, that, it, you know, every, every shot should count. And if you're not out there, you know, that week or that day and you're treating it as if, as if it doesn't count, then you shouldn't even be out there. You're wasting you're wasting your own time, you know? So I just, I've always played, entered every tournament as, you know, this is going to be the last shot that I'm ever going to get to hit. So, you know, let's, let's make it count. You know, obviously some are better than others, but you know, days are better than others, weeks are better than others, but I, I, I treat them all the same as, as they're important. And I think that's, that's only fair to the, to the game and to the tournament that you're playing in. Does the pressure feel any different during a major versus a regular tour event, or can you, being a professional, put your mindset that it's golf and you play shot one at a t- you play the shots one at a time, and you've done this many times before, and you go through your routine, or does it have a different feel this week that it is you know because it is a major? Well, I I, I know that you know in in most tournaments you know it's it's either win or bust. You know, very rarely does anybody ever remember who finishes second. Um, but I know if you play in majors, you know, there's, there's little milestones within themselves. I know like, you know, back in the day when you played on the PGA tour and you played in the U S open, if you couldn't win, you know, you wanted to finish in the top 16 so that you could come back to the U S open next year. You know, you, if you finished in the top eight, you were getting a trip to the masters, you know, so there were little tournaments within each other. So yes, you know, and as far as major goes, yeah, you know, there's a little more emphasis on, 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 if you can't win of finishing those spots, you know, in any other tournament, it just becomes monetary. Um, you know, there's, I, I guess there is the, the rule that, you know, if you finish in the top 10 in the tournament, that you get an invite to that tournament again the following week. But for the most part, you know, the, the majors tend to carry so much more clout when you finish at the top. You know, there's a difference between finish 8th and ninth. There's a difference between finish 16th and 17th. So, you know, but for the most part, it's, you know, like I said, it's, you, you got to treat every shot like it's, like this is the last one you're ever going to get to hit, and you know, let's make it count and let's make it the best that we got. So, with your current season, I was kind of looking at, you know, where you're at this year, and it's it's pretty solid in my opinion. I get your opinion on, it, but second place finish at Toshiba, 43rd on the money list. Stats look pretty good. Not a win yet, but pretty consistent play. Um, what's sort of your assessment of of your season? What's sort of the goals for the rest of the season? And and you know, if you were going to grade yourself, how would you say you did sort of on your first year back full time on, on you know playing professional golf? It's been a while, and you're this is kind of the first year getting back at it full time. Uh, honestly, honestly, my I had three really good tournaments in a row: the uh, the Chubb Classic in Naples, uh, Tucson, and the uh, uh, Newport Beach tournament. I I played really, really solid. I did I did a lot of good things. I did a lot more good things than I did bad things those weeks. Um, I re- I really, I had it, honestly, I had it in the bag at Newport beach. Um, I just, you know, I peaked a little bit on a putt, left it, you know, five or six feet short and then missed the follow up and then did not bury the last hole. And, you know, I got to think in, if you give me that opportunity 10 times that, you know, eight times I'm going to win it outright. One time I'm going to get, I get into a playoff and the other time I'm not going to win it. And it just happened to be, you know, that, that 10th, 10th scenario. And, you know, I was, I was really disappointed for a long time. And I, I think for too, for too long, because I, I couldn't, I couldn't quite get it out of my mind. I kept, I kept replaying it over and over and over again. Um, you know, and it was even, you know, days, weeks, months afterwards. And I just, you know, I, I was kind of in a funk. Um, and then my game became pretty stagnant. Um, you know, like I said, we're constantly working on it, but I seem to work on the wrong things. And, 
you know, I could, I could never get out of my own way. Um, for the most part, uh, you know, the, and, and the year has just been, it, it kind of been adequate. Um, it hasn't been terrible, but I've, I've missed a lot of opportunities within each rounds and within each tournament, you know, to really, to really improve and set myself and, and put myself in a better place, you know, than 43rd on the money list. I think I've, I think I'm a better player than that. Um, I, I've seen some of it at times, but I've understandably, I've seen it the other way as well. So, um, I, I'm, I'm happy with my position this week. I'm not real happy with the three putt on the last hole that, uh, tends to make for a restless night, but, uh, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to this weekend. And, you know, like we talked about earlier, so, you know, I'm a big fan of Exmoor country club and, you know, and, and of the senior PGA camp or the senior uh, player championship. You know, and as a golfer, I mean, I understand exactly what you're, you know, you missed that last shot or, or you didn't finish it off on even the amateur level. It can sit with you. Do you think, and you were talking about, you have to kind of let it go. Is it sometime, is it good that it eats at you because of that motivation that when you're back there the next time you're ready for it? Or is it better at sometimes, is it the flip side of that is it's golf and once the round's over, you have to let it go. I could see how that could go both ways where you'd want that as motivation, but the, the, on the flip side of that, right, when you kind of repeg it against the next time, you have to get out of your mind and sort of let it go. So do you let those things kind of burn a little bit to get the desire going? Is it almost like a good thing, or do you have to at some point flush it and say it's over, but next time I'm there it's not going to happen again like the way it went down? Well, I, I think me personally or whatever, I have, a, I have a hard time letting letting the bad go. Um, you know, when, when you do something really, really good, you're you're trying to do that. And when you do something really, really bad, you're not trying to do that. So I think those, in, in my opinion, for me, it it, uh, it really eats away at me because, you know, it's a fairly straightforward putt I had on the last hole. I know it's fast. Um, I know it breaks a lot to the right. And I just hit it a little too hard. And, you know, I, I knocked it five or six feet high. I can accept that. But the five or six footer coming back is in, inside the hole and straight uphill. I mean, just, they don't paint them any easier than that. And I just... You know, I didn't do. I didn't intend to miss the putt, but I did. But you know, I just I feel it's just a momentum buster. Um, I, I think you have to be really, you know, you have to have a short term memory loss out here. I think it's better for better for you as an individual, and it's much better for your game. Yeah, if you can simply let it go, and sit sit there and um, you know let it let it burn underneath you. The more you know, it's just another variable inside inside your head that doesn't need to be there. Um, and it just inhibits focus on either the next shot or the next round. So, I mean, we're all guilty of it. I can't, you can't sit there and point a finger and it's, it's not as easy as everybody would think it'd be just to forget about it. You know, it's just, I think that's human nature. You know, some people are just built and wired that way and you just, you know, it's just, you know, people are, have a glass that's half full, half empty. You know, I just, uh, I don't want to say mine is half empty, but you know, at times I don't think I can help it. I think it's just who I am. Yeah, and the the game will drive you nuts at some point, right? I'm, my my mindset's very much like yours, where you know it's it's hard to let the bad stuff go. I, I I understand both sides of the coin of it, how you could let it simmer and then take it to the next day and use it as motivation, and I can also understand as you know having to let it go and you have to move on to the next round and try to go low the next day. But it's always interesting how guys can handle that. You can use it one way or the other, and and. Um, the conversations I've had with other touring pros, it's always interesting to kind of get into the mind to see, you know, I've also talked to guys where that simmering of not getting there is a great motivator. So um, it's an interesting concept of how you guys sort of take that information and what you do with it. So I find that part fascinating. Um, also last year is interesting. How is it to try it? Because in 17, you had to Monday qualify basically for the Champions Tour events you got in. How was that process? Did you have any status from your PGA Tour career to get into the events, or was everything a Monday qualifier last year? Then as a follow-up, how hard of a schedule is that to make, knowing you're not, you know, you, you don't have your week planned out, you don't have your schedule planned out? How was that process last year, and what was sort of the good and the bad of it? Well, I, I didn't have any status. Um, you know, I had... I played nine years on the PGA Tour. Um, I never quite got to the 150 career cuts threshold, um, or 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 winning the tournament. The uh, I think the requirement now is you had to have won um, three PGA events, and you had to have played um, 75% of the 
tournaments that you're eligible for, whether they are on the PGA Tour or web, web-based tournaments, um, in order to stay on the active list. You stayed on that active list and you fulfilled those requirements. I think they give you, in some cases, they give you a one, one-year pass out here. Some places they give you a two-year pass. Um, or if you've, you know, obviously made career money, it's, you know, in the millions of millions, and then, uh, you know, guys you know, might be afforded a two or three or four or five-year exemption. But uh, the, the, going through the Monday, have, you know, having to go through the Monday qualifiers, you know, it's, it's impossible to make a schedule because you don't know where you're going to be the day after the qualifier. You know, if you, you go out and you play good, play, you know, a solid round of golf and make it through, well, you know, you're going to be at the tournament. So, you know, a lot of times we're having to find, you know, alternative, um, you know, residency or whatever. We know whether it's just extend the hotel or find a different hotel. So, you know, most of the time, the qualifiers were in the same cities, but, you know, a lot of times they were on the opposite side of towns. So, you know, having to check out of a hotel just to check back in. If you play bad, you know, now you're looking for a flight. Do I go back home? Do I go kind of towards the next tournament? Do I go to the next tournament? You know, it's just, but that's, but that's all scheduling. And there's not, I don't think there's one guy out here that, you know, is trying to Monday qualify that hasn't been down that road at some point, whether just starting out in their career or, you know, whether chasing the senior tour around. Um, so, I mean, it's, it sounds like it might be a, a tough deal or a raw deal, but I think we've all learned to cope with it. Nobody's ever happy with it, but, uh, you know, we make it work. And then getting through Q school this year had to be huge, which is, I mean, it's tough to just get through Q school. I think there's what, five spots or something like that. I mean, you got to really play to get out there and that has to make this year so much easier to be able to set your schedule, kind of do it on your terms. That that's a huge accomplishment to get through that gauntlet. And then do you think last year just playing out there a little bit and then having to tough it through those Monday qualifiers, did it kind of make you ready for this season to sort of fine-tune your game per se? Well, I, I, would, I would say that playing in a few tournaments last year and going through the school, I could evaluate my game by seeing who, who's around me, who I'm playing against, you know, what, what do they bring to the table. Um, you know, we all, we all know what we're capable of. You know, most of us you know, are more realistic than others. You know, we realize that, you know, hey, I'm capable of doing this at any moment, but I'm also capable of doing this, you know, long term, here's where I am, you know, and then you evaluate, say, okay, you know, here's a guy I played with, you know, he's doing this, you know, on a consistent basis, are you better than him? Or are you not better than him? I mean, there's, I'm not going to lie to you, you know, the first time I played with Ernie Els in South Africa, is, I'm not going to beat this kid, you know, it's, I can beat him on a given day, I can beat him on a week where he doesn't show up. But, you know, over the long run, over a 10-year career, over a 15-year career, over a 20-year career, I just, I, I've, got, I've got nothing for him. You know, I can, hang, I can hang with him for a while, but the kid was, he was just blessed to be the talent of talents. The, uh, the first time that, uh, you know, Tiger set scene, you know, out, out on the PGA Tour, you know, you sit there and you watch, watch his practice routine, you know, you watch what he does off the golf course. It's like, wow, it's, I've never seen anybody work that hard, you know, and, you know, he's working to be number one. Oh, yeah, we all, we all think we want to be number one. But I've seen the distractions that come with it. So, ah, I think I'd settle for five or six. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's just, it's just these, guys, these guys, you know, they, they work their whole life to, to be that guy. And then when they get there, it's, you know, it's the distractions that they have to deal with every single week with, you know, you know op- obligations for this and obligations for that, sponsorships and, you know, everybody pulling you left and right from every which direction. It just, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want that. And you, you can't avoid it. It's there. So but getting back to the, you know, evaluations and all that stuff is, you know, I, I know what I'm capable of doing. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that in the next couple of years I can get there. But if I hadn't made it through the school this year, I'm not so sure that I, I probably would have tried a few Monday qualifiers here and there. But I'm not so sure I wouldn't have put my sticks in the trunk or whatever and said, you know, I'd just be happy with playing with my buddies and being everyday Joe and, you know, be that guy who, you know, likes to play social golf or whatever. But just, you know, I just, I don't have it anymore. But, you know, there's there's always that fire inside of you that says, don't quit. But eventually you got to be a realist and say, you know what, it's just enough's enough. <laughs> it's time for something else. But like I said, with the results that you've had when you've played well, you've almost won. It has to be satisfying to know that you're close like the game is there you know you're 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 not going out there finishing t38 every time you tee it up the potential is there if you put it together and that it's got to be exciting to kind of come back and and see your game you know really really being able to compete against the best 
you know, for the, on the Champions Tour. So that part has to be, I guess, extremely rewarding. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it has to be, I would assume, kind of a cool feeling after all these years to kind of be back out there and doing it. Absolutely. But, you know, it's, I, I think, you know, when, when, when the moment, or, you know, when the moment comes, you know, where you got to win, you got to win. I mean, that's winning is everything. And I, I, I knew it when I was on the PGA tour and I knew it when I was playing the Hogan tour, I knew it when I was playing my, you know, my, my satellite tournaments when I, when I first turned pro, you know, it's in, in order, you have to, you have to be a proven winner. And after nine years on the PGA tour and not having ever won, you know, I had a couple seconds or whatever, but those are, those are, those are the disappointments. And I think, you know, it, it all comes full circle. You know, we've talked about, you know, how a guy's glass is half empty and I can see how guys can be that way. And I, I understand, you know, maybe that's why I'm wired that way. It's, you know, until you start clipping off a victory, you know, every once in a while, you're always going to feel like you're inferior to everybody else out here. And it's, you know, the golf is a hard enough game to play without knowing that, you know, one guy's better than another and one course is just, you know, not built for you. And I think most of these guys out here that, you know, like David Karens and David Toms and, you know, him and F, doesn't matter where they play, they're going to shine because every course is built for them. But, you know, guys that, you know, are not wired like them or are not as confident as them. There are, there are times and there are golf courses where they're just going to be uncomfortable and, you know, fidgety and, and, uh, you know, that's just, that's the state, that's the state of a player. And like I said, you know, we're all wild, wired a little different and some people know it, some people don't. And, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, I, I could be, you know, one of the, you know, perennial players out here, but until I, until I prove it to myself, you know, I think I'm always going to think the other way. So when I was doing my background work last night, I saw you really didn't play much professional golf since 2008 and 2009. So when you decided you're going to kind of go for a you know career 2.0 and do this, how much work did it take to get your game back to even go out there and Monday qualify and, and, and get ready last year? How much work did it take? And, and what parts were the hardest to kind of get back to be really high-level, competitive, ready? And what parts came back the easiest? during that transition where you were kind of doing it again? Right. I think the, you know, the driving of the golf ball, um, came back, came back the quickest. I don't think there's any question about that. It's, you know, cause when I played golf, that was something I, I continued to do, you know, every time I teed it up, now, I was I'm not going to lie to you. I was doing a lot of, you know, corporate functions, you know, where you're out playing scrambles and, you know, just not, not playing your normal round of golf. And I, I probably went a couple, three years without ever hitting a bunker shot. Um, and you know, that, that, that facet of the game, the, the shots that you don't practice, you know, the really crazy ones where, you know, a guy like Mickelson shines, you know, that's throwing them in the woods and hacking it out and putting yourself in a place where just a golf ball could never end up except for that one time, you know, um, those are, those are the shots right there that, you know, I just, I really struggle with, um, you know, this, not so much the short game, you know, there's like, if I'm just hitting a chip out of the rough, you know, I'm as good as I ever have been. But, you know, you get those kind of weird, awkward lies, you know, maybe to a tucked pin or just there's a, just a couple snags that keep it from being straightforward. Those are the ones that, you know, I'm just, I just really don't have a whole lot of confidence in. And they're the ones that, you know, I've really struggled with. And, you know, currently I'm out here on the uh, practice practice uh, area. Exmoor has an awesome little, you know, probably two or three acre chipping area. So I've been here most of the week. Um, I, I love it when places – you know, afford us the opportunity to, to work on our games like this. Um, it's few and far between, you know, this week they've got, got an excellent, excellent area. Um, and I've just been, you know, kind of tooling in and out of the bunkers, you know, throwing balls kind of all over the place. Um, you know, more often than not, the practice areas, you know, are limited to one side kind of firing to the green. Here you have, you can fire at each of the three greens from 360 degrees. So it's, uh, it's one of the best practice facilities I've ever seen. What did you do during that kind of 10-year period between not playing professional golf and getting back on it? Did you did you just play corporate golf and, and played long enough on tour where you had name recognition where you could do the corporate thing and make you know a nice living doing it? Or did you start another business? Or what did you sort of do during that 10-year period that you, you weren't playing professional golf? Well, I had, I had back surgery in 2008. Um, it was the physical therapy and the process of trying to get back to playing 
um, it, it didn't work out so well. Um, I, I kind of lost a little bit of my competitive edge um, that, you know, most of the good players have. Um, I'd lost a little bit of my will, my desire. Um, you know, it was going to take a little bit of extra work. It was going to take, you know, a lot more off the golf course uh, discipline. And I just, I kind of lost all that. Started a new life, uh, you know, started my own little small landscaping company. Um, was having more success, you know, win- winning bids and doing and doing installs than I was on the golf course. And I just, you know, kind of one part of my life or whatever had kind of phased away and, you know, a new part had, had started. But I don't think you, especially as a professional, once you've been on the inside of the ropes, you know, everything else on the outside just gets ruined for you. So, you know, I think there was always that desire to to get back into it. Um, and, you know, obviously it's when you turn 50, you're afforded that opportunity. But, uh, you know, I wasn't going to kid myself. You know, when when I had surgery, I was, you know, my, my early early 40s and, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't going to go out there and beat any of the 25 year olds. And I just, you know, I guess my, my option at the time was to go out and play the web, but web is the web was designed more for the kids coming out of college to keep them in the game, to keep them, you know, working on their game so that, you know, when they get their shot that they're, they're primed and ready for it. You know, it wasn't really designed for 42, 45, 48 year olds, you know, to kind of go out you know, and, and compete, it's, you know, I guess you, in one facet, yes, you could pre- be preparing yourself for the senior tour, but, you know, out here we're playing courses, you know, that are 68 to 7,100 yards and the web ter- tournaments are, you know, the, most of them are 7,000 to 7,400 yards. So it's, I don't think any, anybody's having any great success or whatever, any burning desire to go out there and compete with them. So, you know, that was just kind of like in those, one of those go-betweens where, you know, maybe I should just, keep doing what I'm doing until I'm 50 or whatever, and then make the most of the opportunity when I turn 50 and, you know, try it a couple of times and see what happens. And like you said, you know, it's making it through the school or whatever is kind of giving me new life. But, you know, as far as working my game, I'm, I'm still working on it a year and a half later. So I still got a long ways to go. Yeah. And, and you know, it was fun for me to be out there on Tuesday because the course was closed. So I could kind of walk inside the ropes. Uh, they were nice enough to give me media passes for the day. And, you know, like I know you guys practice and I know you work at it, but I spent like two and a half hours with Tom Kite, and he's sixty eight years old and he is like grinding this golf course out and learning it and pract- I mean he's practicing at a level I I don't practice at and it was just awesome to watch and spend time with him and just to see it and I, I don't think the average person realizes the time and effort even on the Champions Tour. Even a guy like that level of success and been out there for so long, the effort you guys put in. And it's it's cool to see it up front of how much time it takes to play at the level you guys play at. Um, not really a question. I'm just made, like, like I was amazed how many guys are still out there at 6 o'clock at night after being out there all day beating balls. Um, so as a follow-up to that, what is a typical day on the Champions Tour like on a practice day, a Tuesday, not a pro-am day? What does it sort of look like for you? How, are you in the gym? How many hours of practice are you putting in? Do you have to watch to not over practice or is it a full eight, 10 hour day? Like I was kind of watching out there. A lot of the guys are putting in. I, I don't think there is a such thing as over practicing there. There is a, there is a point where, you know, enough's enough. You know, if you're just going through the motions just to, to say, you know, I, Oh my God, I chipped for five hours today. You know, you know it, I think the tutelage that, you know, perfect practice makes perfect. Um, is something that we all kind of strive for. And I think once, once we, you know, get to a certain point, you know, during the day, I, I, you know, whether you're beating balls on the range or making putts on the putting green or chipping on the chipping green, you know, once the technique gets down, you, you can't, you can't continue to learn that technique. You know, I got it, you know, okay, enough's enough. Now I need to go to something else. You know, I think great practice is, you know, going from the chipping green to the bunker to the putting green, maybe firing a few eight irons, back to the chipping green, you know, because that's the way we play golf. We don't hit, you know, 25 consecutive drivers. We don't hit, uh, you know, 25 five irons in a row. We don't hit, you know, 25 three-footers in a row. You know, we, we hit a three-footer, and then we hit a driver, and then we hit an eight-iron. Then we hit a five-iron, you know, and then we hit a bunker shot. And it's just you're kind of all over the place. And, you know, most of us don't practice that way. 
Um, it would be nice if, you know, obviously if the chipping greens and driving range and putting greens were all on all in one area, and I think you'd see more people do it. But the fact that they're kind of spread out, you know, one's usually on one side of the golf course and the other one's centrally located. Um, and then obviously a chipping green, you know, is probably usually on the other side. Um, you know, it's that's kind of the way we've kind of ingrained it. But uh, I, I think if, if, if you're not – if you're not putting a couple hours, three hours of work in around your round of golf, you know, with even the warm up, you know, we're not really out there just going through the motions, you know, just trying to loosen up or whatever. I mean, we're still trying to, you know, prepare a swing to take to the golf course. Cause I know there's times where, you know, sometimes I tee it up or whatever and the ball's going left or right. No matter what I do, I can't make the ball go the other way, so, but at least, you know, okay, this is what I'm bringing to the course, you know, I'm bringing in left or right you know, after the golf course, that's where we try and fix it. And if you're trying to fix it before or whatever, you, you've got no chance. Yeah. It's, um, like I said, I think I practice. And I have, after I left that day, I'm like, no, I don't practice. These guys practice. This is work they're putting in. It was, it was awesome to see it up close of, um, you know, that's why you guys play at that level. It's, there's a lot of background work to doing it, to, to play at the level you guys play at. And it was as a golf fan and, you know, and, and kind of doing the podcast, it was really cool to see up close of the effort and the seriousness of the practice, even like somebody Mr. Kite was putting in. It was it was really cool to see up front. Um, got another question of another major coming up. I think this one's pretty cool. You guys are going to the old course at uh, St. Andrews, which I would imagine has to be fantastic uh, place to have a championship at. Have you played there before? If you have, how's the course set up for you? And um, how excited are you kind of, I'm assuming you're playing in it, kind of going to the home of golf and uh, trying to win a major on that venue? Uh, I, I have not played there. And, you know, I've only seen bits and pieces on TV. You know, you, you see the first tee shot, but very rarely, you know, they may, they may have followed, you know, with the new telecast, you know, they may follow, you know, a Tiger or a Phil Mickelson throughout the round of golf. But typically, you know, you see 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, everybody knows the, the stories of those holes, you know, the tournaments that were won and lost on them. Um, you know, the old course is, you know, the origination of the game. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's going to be a special tournament. But unfortunately, I have to qualify on the Monday because um, there's 120 exempt players. Um, but uh, it's really, it's more based off of past champions of all the PGA Masters uh British Open, U.S. Open, um, and then last year's money list, and then current money list of the, the scattered uh, se- senior uh, tours, you know, throughout the world, and it just comes up to that many exempt players, and the rest of us are, you know, kind of uh, in- into the qualifiers on uh, Monday. So I will. Uh, I'm actually flying flying over Monday. Going to spend a little while in uh, London because I think to fly over there just a couple days before, you know, you're going to be a little bit jet lagged. I'd like to get over there for a full week or whatever because, you know, like I said, you know, there's no better special place than um, than the old course. And, you know, this is probably the last opportunity that, uh, you know, I'll ever get to play it or have, have a chance to play it. So, uh, so you know, I want to make the most of it. Yeah, I mean, what a great spot to be stuck for a couple of days up in Scotland and St. Andrews, right? I mean, oh, it would be awesome. Yeah, so, well, while, every, while everybody's here boiling in 90 degrees or whatever, I'll be – soaking up the 70 degree sun over there yeah it's gonna i can't wait to see it it's gonna be a great championship what's your background how did you start playing the game of golf and kind of falling in love with it who introduced you and and what was that process i think you know i was i was a pretty good athlete when i was a kid you know like like most golfers you know i played a little bit of baseball a little bit of football um you know pick up the hand-eye coordination of tennis and ping pong and pool and stuff like that but it's you know i was kind of a late bloomer you know, I was kind of a scrawny little white kid, you know, never quite tall enough to play, you know, b-ball or, you know, I certainly wasn't thick enough to endure, you know, the pounding of pounding of football. Uh, but baseball and, and golf were kind of something that became a little bit more natural to me. But, you know, golf ended up winning out. Um, and I just, you know, I don't, I don't regret any of it because I know golf is, you know, today may or may not be still the nerdy sport. But I know back in my day, it, it certainly was. But, uh, you know, it's, even, you know, some of my memories that I have, you know, from being, you know, 12 to 15 to 18 years old or whatever, you know, are, are pretty special or whatever. And things that, you know, you know, I'll, I'll always, I'll always remember or whatever, because, you know, this, this game is, it's, it's a lot more special than most people think. And, I, you know, a lot of us don't find out until later in life, 
you know, how enjoyable it can be to be outside for four or four and a half hours or whatever with your buddies. You know, I think most of us find out uh, too late, you know, how great, how great it is because, you know, we're too consumed with, you know, weekend barbecues and nine to five jobs. <laughs> It'd be, ni- be nice if everybody, you know, took an, took an afternoon off every once in a while and soaked up the sun or whatever on a golf course. Cause that's, this is a, it's a really cool experience. It really is. Hey, I'm with you on that. I mean, I'm in the golf business, and my favorite thing to do is still golf. So, yeah, it, once you get that addiction in you, I totally understand where you're coming from, right? It's it's a beautiful way to spend an afternoon, and, and I love it as much today at my age as, as I did when I was a kid. So, um, Also, you know, you went to University of Georgia, great lineage of a lot of really good players went through that program. Um, how would you pick that university, and how was your time there? How much did you enjoy it? Uh, I was, you know, I, I was, I guess I was kind of a mama's boy, you know, growing up. So when it came time to pick a school, I, I, I honestly, I think Georgia picked me. Um, but you know, the fact that, you know, I kind of wanted to get away, you know, I wanted to kind of get a, you know, branch out of my own, spread my own wings, whatever the cliche is, um, just kind of do my own thing. And, you know, Georgia was from where I grew up in South Florida, you know, it was several hundred miles away. So it's not one of those things where, you know, mommy or daddy or whatever, get in a car and come see me every weekend, you know, and I, and I couldn't do the same thing. And I, and I just, it was, it was a really, really special time for me. You know, I learned to do a lot of things that, you know, my mom and dad would always do for me. Um, and I'm just, you know, spending three or four years there just, you know, it's just, again, you know, it's memories, but it's memories I have because of the game of golf, you know, that, that you know, I'll always remember. And, you know, now our football program's making a big turnaround or whatever. So now there's, now there's new excitement and, <laughs> I'm looking forward to. I'm disappointed in our schedule because I really wanted to go to the LSU game. I've never been to Baton Rouge for a college football game. That's the week we're at Cary, so that was a big, big downer. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's the school's got a really, I mean, athletics huge part of that university. And like I said, gosh, on the regular PGA Tour now, you can almost have a Ryder Cup team of guys who went to the University of Georgia. I mean, it's it's crazy how the quality of players that's turned out over the last say 15, 20 years. Um, and then you go pro. In 1988, so I always like to talk to the guys about the stories of turning pro like in the 80s when the mini tours were all over. Like, I'm assuming, you know, did you do the mini tour routine and and drive from tournament to tournament? That always had to be an interesting experience. Is there some great stories from that period of time when you were kind of out there chasing the dream, per se? I did. I was. Uh, I played the J.C. Goosey Tour, which is typically based out of Orlando. Um, played a couple of TPA and TPT events, USGT. Um, everything back then was similar to the FBI, CIA, or whatever. It had three or four initials, and everything. G was always golf, and T was always tour. Um, P was P was mostly players, but it's you know some of them were based in Texas, some of them were based in the Dakotas area, some of them moved up and down the Eastern Seaboard, California. You know, it just depend on what your feel for was. You know, maybe. You know, golf is not a not a cheap sport to play. You know, there's a lot of travel involved and a lot of entry fees, caddies, stuff like that. So I mean, you know, if you if you previously had a job and had some money to burn, you know, maybe you did you became a little bit more nationwide. You know, if funds were a little limited, you tend to you know stick to either a certain region or a certain certain state. But you know, growing up in Florida and you know going to school at Georgia, you know, it was kind of a no brainer for me to stay down in Florida. And that's honestly, that's probably the best competition in the country you know none of the people in texas and california will argue with you but uh um orlando is you know home to probably you know a dozen to 25 tour players if not more you know central florida you know probably has 30 to 50 so um, if you want the best competition that's probably where you're going to find it on a consistent basis so i mean that's kind of where my game enveloped um i went overseas for for a couple years uh, went to went to South Africa, um, went to Argentina, went to Australia, um, and then there we come. You know, you come kind of witness the uh, wow. You know, it's there's a lot more than just Florida. Um, it's same competition, same good players, just a different different levels here and there. Um, but you know, all the travels and all that stuff is just you know awesome memories and all all worthwhile for sure. And then you get to the, which was the Hogan Tour back then, right? Essentially the Web.com Tour now in in, in 91. And you pick up two wins in 93 and 94. What what matured or changed in your game where you kind of went out there from kind of mini tours to getting your your Hogan Tour card and then being a two-time winner out there? Was that just a natural progression on just belief and getting better and, and kind of just taking step by step up the ladder per se? 
I, I think it was, you know, part of it's, you know, when I was young, I wasn't really committed to, get, to golf, and I was more committed to, you know, basketball, and football was, you know, one time a year, and baseball was another time a year, and, you know, you were, if you were a good athlete, you know, and the coaches could see, you know, maybe that, that there was some potential, you know, that they were willing to slide and let you be a three or four start, uh, a three or four sport player. Um, and then after, you know, getting into high school, you know, I didn't play basketball anymore. And, you know, once we, once we got through, um, you know, also getting, getting, the, you know, the high school or whatever, stopped playing football and I was able to become a little bit, you know, more of a full-time golfer. The only problem is, is, you know, there were nine, 10 and 12 year olds that were being born and bred, you know, to play. So I had a, a late start to the party. Um, it, it took me a long time physically before I, caught up to them you know i didn't, didn't hit my growth spurt until in the college um and i certainly you know as far as like maturity uh, mental capacity stuff like that was, you know i didn't reach that until probably in like my mid, mid to late 20s um just you know i still didn't know who i was who i wanted to be who i needed to be who i needed to play like who i needed to emulate you know it, it, at times again you know guilty of trying to be you know i see somebody else who goes out and plays really good and all of a sudden i want to be like him you know, in a blink of an eye and then, you know, realizing that, you know, I'm not who that guy is. I just, I need to be me and I need to be the best of me. So, you know, a lot of times I think I was just, you know, the reason for the late maturation is, you know, I just, it took me, it took me a long time to figure out who I was and who I needed to be and what I needed to do for me, for me to be successful. You know, I can honestly say back in, back in college, I was kind of a seat of my pants kind of kid. You know, I swung really hard at everything and kind of hoped for the best. <laughs> and I'd make a lot of birdies and I'd make a lot of others. Well, that not that most college? Yeah, that's most college. I mean, thinking back of everyone's game right at that period of time, I, you know, right? Like you just swung at it hard, and if you were on that day, you yeah, were well, on. And at, at Georgia, I played with uh, Peter Persons. He was the he was a, you know he was a first teamer um, my my last two years. And he was, he was a total opposite of me in every, every capacity. You know, he was a fairways, a greens, and let, my, let, my, let me beat you with my putter. Whereas, you know, for 18 holes, he wasn't better than me. He was better than me for all 18. But, you know, there was, you know, I'm going out and making five, six, seven birdies around, and, you know, five birdies, I'm, I could still shoot over par. You know, seven birdies, I was shooting around par, maybe a couple under. But, you know, he was going around every single, every single day at even par to four or five under, you know, because he didn't make mistakes. He was never going backwards. He was always going forwards, you know, whereas, you know, I, I might make two or three birdies in a row and in a blink of an eye or whatever, I'd be back to level par again. And I just, it, it took me a long time to grow up to realize that, you know, swinging for home runs on every tee is, is, is great and it's fun, but it's not consistency. You know, and if you want, if you want to, if you want to be there at the end of the day, you know, you've got to be more consistent. And it took me a long time to realize that. Uh, I'm 51. I'm sure, not sure I still realize it, but uh, I try, I try, I try better now. You know, I try to be a little bit more disciplined. You know, before every, every tee shot was a driver. It didn't matter how narrow the hole was, how far it was, I was going to hit driver. You know, if, if for some reason driver was too much, you know, I'd take something off of it or, and try and guide it. You know, now, now I realize that sometimes you just have to hit an iron off the tee and just put it in play so that you can put it on the green and that you can go out and I can be more like Peter Persons, you know, where I let my putter do the damage. Because to me, putting is, is my strength. I don't, I don't make every putt, but I very seldom do I ever make mistakes like I, like I did on the last hole today. It still happens, but I, I, I never give myself – enough chance to win a golf tournament or to be the best that I can be with my putter or whatever. I, I still put too much emphasis on the other thir- on the other 13 clubs in the bag. And I try not to, but I'm an idiot. No, no, well, no, yeah. Right. I mean, but and then you, you, you watch, you know, like how did Luke Donald get to be best in the world by sort of just plotting it and then giving himself chances with a putter. Right. And then every day was kind of like the easiest 68 you ever saw. And he wouldn't out Absolutely. while he, Yeah, it wasn't like yeah, he's hitting it, it 350 yards. He, he, yeah, it, it just, yeah, it was stress-free. He kept, his, he kept his blonde hair for longer than everybody else. Everybody else had already turned gray. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, he just – he. I mean, and it, so there is some merit to that. I think there's like – if you look at the stats, like at your guys' level, the more chances you give yourself at a – what is like 22 feet and in, like reasonable birdie putts, that's essentially the key. 
if, if it, you guys are going to make your share of those putts, and at the end of the day, it adds up to four under par. It's, it's crazy how the numbers kind of back up what you're saying, that you know, it doesn't have to look like a home run every time to play really good, solid, consistent golf. It's nice to have the horsepower when you need it, but chances at birdies and reasonable putts, like they like said, thinking of David Toms, right? He's been really successful for a long time with that sort of scenario. Give himself a look. And then at the end of the day, you add him all up and he just shot the easiest 67 you ever saw. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how, you know, you've kind of came to that and, and, you know, hopefully that, that kind of translates over to the champions tour and with what you're doing. So, um, other question on the PGA tour, you get out there in 90, you know, in 95 through 97, you had a hell of a good run. Um, got a couple part question here. What was, what was the key to that really consistent play? And then you had a great run in the majors of top fives in the masters, U S open PGA. What about your game really translated during that period over to major championships and, and, in what sort of keys or, or systems did you find when you were really, really playing well in the PGA Tour? What worked well for you? I think it's more in how the, tur- the tur- those tournaments set their courses up. You know, typically PGA Championship, U.S. Open, um, they tend to have, you know, four to six inch rough. And like I said, it took me a long time to realize that it's more important to hit it fa- in the fairway than it is to hit it 300 yards. But in the PGA events, you know, where the rough is a little bit shorter, it's more about, you know, we want to keep it perfectly groomed. You know, we want it to look like a postcard. Um, you know, they keep the grasses down a little bit more. You know, the roughs are, are thick, but they're not unplayable. Um, you know, they, you tend to go out and, you know, you, you hit it a little bit harder. But those courses, you know, in those majors kind of forced me to be a little bit more disciplined. You know, you kind of forced to, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, no matter how what the length of the hole is, you know, you're, you, you've got you've got to put the ball in play on this hole. You know, you have to hit the fairway in order to hit the green. You don't always have to have a wedge in your hand, you know, to hit it close. You know, sometimes you, you can hit it close with a six iron. It can be done. Um, but it, like I said, it took me a long time to figure that out. But when I did figure that out, this, you know, it, it was it was well after, you know, my, my successes in those tournaments and, and in those couple years. It was like I said, it was those courses, you know, Medina's, Congressionals, um, that that kind of forced you to. You have to play the way I'm designed. You can't cheat the system. You know, there's like out here at Exmoor. You know, you can take a take a driver on some shorter holes or whatever and thread the bunker. Because even if you hit it in the bunker, the way the bunkers are designed, they're fairly flat. You know, you can you can get out of them. Whereas you know the British Open style courses, you know some of these, you know, more modern designs. You know these gaping, you know, lips and stuff like that. If you hit in there, they're so much more penile than a regular PGA event. And I think you just you're kind of forced to play more of that way, and I think that's what really helped me, and really realize that there's more than one way to skin a cat than just you know swinging from 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 your toes and trying to hit it as far as you can and making sure you have a wedge in your hand every time. Yeah, that's sort of like translating what you're saying now at this point of your career of how you're playing the game, which almost was from what I'm hearing, it almost those courses almost forced you to play how you're sort of viewing the game at this point. Hence the great results for just having chances and playing what the course will sort of give you at times. That's right. You also had the, uh, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate, I didn't say fortunate looking back, to um, play when a Mr. Tiger Woods was starting to uh, come on the scene and play some pretty darn good golf. Um, any good Tiger stories from back in the day? And then when you first saw him out on tour with you, did you see that level of dominance he would have in the 90s and the, in the 2000s? Well, you know, my my first year, you know, you had Justin Leonard, you know, that, that came that came out. You know, he's he's you know still a couple years younger, but I mean, he was he was the kid that you know was was the next greatest thing. Um, you know, and he just you know another you know just played played it. He's got his five or six sponsor exemptions and made his whatever money or whatever, and you know never really had to go to the school. But you know, you hear a lot about Tiger. You'd see him at the U.S. Amateurs. You know, you'd see him at the the Stanford tournaments. You you know read about the the tournaments that he would play during the summertime. And you see the scores that he's putting up, and they're just you know he's just he's just killing the competition every single week. Um, and then you know my only my only good Tiger story is you know after a round I, I came into the, the the therapy trailer and he was running on the treadmill and but they, everybody's was busy on the tables working on other players. 
So I went out and practiced for a couple hours, um, you know, putted for a little while and then came back and there's Tiger still on the treadmill. I'm thinking to myself, I was like, geez, the guy just got off the golf course, played 18 holes and now he's running a marathon. I said, like, who is this guy? <laughs> so, I mean, but that's just, that's just the discipline that he had, you know, that, Hey, if this was, you know, I'm assuming it was his cardio day that, you know, he had to burn however many calories that he wanted to burn. And that's how he does it. And I was like, wow. It's like, you know, you know, I'm kind of more of the, you know, I'd rather just stop and pick up a nice cold beer or something like that and call it a day. Yeah. I, I was, I caddied, uh, I was in college in 94 and I got to caddy in the pro-am on a Monday pro-am. And he was the, he was an amateur at the time, but he was the pro. And it's a Monday pro-am at Cog Hill at the, at the Western. I'm through it. We get his group, right? And I, I got an amateur's bag. And he is grinding on this round, like on a Monday pro-am, like it's the last round of a U.S. Open. And I knew his background and the three juniors and how good he was. And I thought to myself, I've never seen this. I used to caddy all the time at the Champions Tour events in Chicago and, and, and that stuff. And I've never seen that level of commitment to a Monday pro-am. And I was like, this guy's different. I mean, he didn't give a shit about entertaining the people. <laughs> like... Errol was out there with him, and he is, like, grinding this thing out like it's the last round of the U.S. Open. I went, wow. Like, this, this kid yeah, well, is just special. It's just, you know, it's just different. It was a level of intensity that was just different than I've ever seen anybody else in a pro-am. Probably wasn't as much fun for the, the amateurs in the group because we probably wanted to ask them questions and talk to them and learn how to hit a bunker shot. But it was all, it was all business. I mean, and that level I respected where he was coming from. Like he was there to win, and that was a day for him to practice. And he was, he was doing his thing. It was really interesting to see up close. Yeah, he's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's always going to be a great debate as you know who, who the greatest golfer of all time is. But you know, I wasn't uh, wasn't present during the you know the Nicholas Watson, you know Sarah's and Hogan Sneed Sneed eras, and Tiger was you know as close as as I was going to get. You know, and I, I, fortunately, I never got a chance to, you know, play around with him, but I played in front of him a couple times, and I played behind him a couple times, and you just, you see places, he hits it, and then, you know, you watch him going up, up the leaderboard, and you're just like, just awesome. Yeah. You know, it really is, and, you know, pe- people like that, they're, you know, kind of like freakishly, you know, just superior in, in their in their, in their their sport or their field. You know, it's great for the game, and you know, obviously you can see, when Tiger's playing well and when he's in the field, you know, the interest level in golf as to when he's not in the field, you know, it's, you know, the game, the game needs him, you know, and I don't necessarily know that he needs the game anymore, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more fun when he's, when he's there than when he's not there. So totally agree. And I think it's fun to watch him smiling now. It looks like there's joy in it, you know, for a lot of years, well, when I, he was as best. It didn't, I mean, look like it was, sure joy to win but i love seeing him smile and interact with the other players and i want him to be at his best but i actually love this tiger in his 40s it's it's from a fan's perspective i love seeing him out there and looking like he's really enjoying the process i i I, honestly i think he uh you know part of his humility too you know is he realizes that when you do get older (laughs) you're not you're not perfect at every moment so you know when you hit a bad bad one sometimes you got to laugh at it with the board you know, before when he had a bad one, he was, you know, grinding so hard and expected perfection, you know, every single swing, every single putt, you know, you could see the frustration, you know, the, the tempers that we're all, we're all prone to, you know, you, you never, you never saw him get, get dejected. Now you see, you know, kind of a lighter side of him, you know, to where he can actually laugh at himself on occasion. Um, you know, some of the smiles are because he does something great, you know, whether it's, you know, holding, holding a putt or hitting a, you know, great drive or great iron shot or something like that. But, some some of his laughs are like, oh my god, I can't believe I just hit that out of a shot. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's, it's just, yeah, you know, it's, but that's but that's great because nobody ever used to see correct. that side of him, yep. you know, back in the '90s and the 2000s or whatever. And it took it took you know, I, I guess you know some some adversity in his life, or whatever, to make him to realize that you know it's not all about perfection. Eventually, somewhere we all grow up, you know. Some of us later than others. I'm still waiting for my turn, but I'm hopeful it'll come. Well, we'll get you out of here in a second. I just got a couple of quick rapid fires, and we'll let you get back to chipping and putting here. So whatever just kind of comes to your mind on these, just just let me know. Um, best two or three golf courses architecturally you've ever had the chance to play and what made them great? Well, I'm a, I've only been to you know Scotland a couple times. Um, I played Troon and Lytham St. Anne's for my, my venues, but I got to play Carnoustie in the Scottish Open. 
Um, I went over and played uh, Muirfield and Glen Eagles um, prior prior to going to those tournaments. And I'm just a huge fan of just the origination of golf. Um, you know, you, I, I know as, as far as like the Scottish and the English, you know, Lynx is, is actually a grass. So when they say Lynx course, it's a course that's on the coast, you know, and it's the type of grass. Um, it's just an open style with no trees. You know, I know people get frustrated, you know, and don't really understand the history of golf and they come over here and they equate something that's on the coast over here and call it Lynx. But, uh, I mean, I'm just a huge fan of, of Carnoustie, um, and, and Troon. Um, you know, that's why I'd love to play St. Andrews. You know, it's part of it's right there on the sea. Um, I'm looking forward to, um, I'm going to go play London Lynx, which is one of the qualifier courses. It's not the one I'm at, but it's another Lynx course that, and, um, Scott's Craig. Um, they're just they're courses that aren't famous for any reason, just because they've either never never been in the British Open or Scottish Open rotation. But I've heard that they're really, really just awesome links style golf courses. So, I mean, there's you know just growing up or not growing up, but you know just being on those. And I, I think the fact that you know you play courses in America, you get used to a typical design in Chicago. You get used to a you know typical design in the Northeast and Florida and Texas, and it's just it's they, they all. You know, some kind of look the same. Some have their own individuality. But when you go over and you play in Scotland, it's like nothing you've ever seen before. So, I mean, it's, I guess you either love it or hate it, and I just fell in love with it. Oh, I'm with you on that. I got to, I haven't gone to Scotland yet, but I did the trip to southern England, and, and I love that style of golf, you know, the creativity, the wind. You know, it's, it's just a fantastic experience. If, if you love the game, I think most people love playing seaside link style golf. It's, it's, sure. it's a fantastic way to play. Um, most underrated player on the champions tour. Does anyone come to mind that that guy is so good and people don't realize how good that player is? I have played a couple of practice rounds with, uh, um, David Toms. I mean, I know he just won the senior open, but I mean, he, every, every single week, I mean, he's, he's, he's like that, uh, cash register, you know, it's 68, 69, 70, 66, you know, he's just so consistent. Um, and I, 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 but I think as, as far as like when it comes to identity, he, he's the guy that realizes this is who I am. And ever since he's been, you know, kind of the PGA champion and beyond, he realized that this is who I am and I'm never going to try and be anything else but me. I think a lot of guys, you know, they switch manufacturers, you know, they're loyal to this, they're loyal to that, they're changing this, they expect this. And he's just, he's, He's always been David Toms, even when I knew him at, at LSU um, when he was in college. You know, he's the same guy now than he was then. And I, I think as far as, like, underrating people, you know, there's people who are special talents on the golf course, and then there's people who are, you know, awesome off the golf course, but he's got to be the best combo of, of, of all of them. I mean, there's, there's guys I like to play with. There's guys I like to have a nice cold beer with. There's not a lot of guys I like to play golf with then have a nice cold beer with, <laughs> but he, he, he is one of them. I mean, he's just, he's such a genuine person. And I don't think unless you have ever played with him or ever gotten to know him that, you know, anybody could appreciate what a, a special guy he is for the game. And, you know, and obviously for the champion store as well. Well, maybe you could put him in my next question then. So if you could take three other guys off the PGA tour that you that you know, well, or the champions tour, go play a little money game, play a great golf course, have dinner with who, what guys are, what guys would you bring in that to make the foursome? And what do you admire most about those, those guys you would pick? Well, I know, I know we're not supposed to admit to our, our gambling, gambling, but uh, you know, when I played on the PGA tour, Timmy, Timmy Heron, you know, the old lumpster, he was, uh, he was my, he was my working horse. You know, I used to, I used to saddle, saddle him up, uh, you know, once, once a week, you know, typically on, on Tuesdays, you know, and just, just ride, ride, ride him around the golf course. And, you know, it's, I, I loved his caddy. Um, Scotty was, Scotty was great for him, but I would, I would, I would coach Timmy around the golf course. I, I promise you, I would coach him to no less than seven birdies every, every round we played, you know, telling him, Timmy, I, I'd really like to see you hit this club. I mean, I think, I think this is really good for you. I think Scotty, Scotty let Timmy be Timmy. I, I made Timmy be who I wanted him to be. So I would have to take, take lump, lumpy as my partner, but I would like to play, you know, with, with David Toms and, you know, Jerry Kelly, Stricker. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really, really good guys out here. But I would love to play with, you know, the elite talent guys. You know, nobody ever wants to go out and play a pigeon. 
You know, right. you you want to go out and you want to you want to you want to you want to beat the best. So, but I I, I don't I, I would I would never forego not having having Lumpy as my partner. How great will he be for the Champions Tour when he's out there? Because I, I love Lumpy and I think he has like a cult following of like people just dig him. Like I I have to imagine he's that guy in real life as you get the projection of him as a tour player. Like funny as I, hell, like the best guy in the world, right? Like he has to be. I'd be disappointed if he wasn't. Yeah, he has, he has a great, great personality. Um, he's great. He's great for the game. You know, he's he, he's he, he's someone that you know the everyday person you know who who spends fifteen to twenty five dollars for a ticket. You know that uh, you know they can they can relate to him. You know, it's Timmy's. You know. Ne- never tried to be Adonis. He's never tried to be John Daly. He's never tried to be this guy. He's just he's just a lumpster, and I think everybody loves him for being for being that and staying staying true to his form. And um, you know, I, I think he's still got you know a year, a year and a half left or whatever. But uh, he, he'll he'll be great out here. He really will because I, I you know he still plays you know half a dozen to ten ten tournaments a year. You know he still still can put put up the numbers in the 60s or whatever which you know I'm not so sure if I was playing a PGA then you know 73 7400 yards I, you know I got that in me so um so I think he's 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 more than ready yeah I mean that's a we're, we're more than ready for him too <laughs> I think yeah I think he'd be perfect out there I know he's playing in the John Deere this week kind of uh you know and across the state from you guys but no he's, he's actually played pretty well in the limited amounts he's been out there this year and like I think he's like I'm from the Midwest he's a Midwest guy like all my buddies love Lumpy, so I can't wait for him to go out in the Champions Tour. He'll be perfect for that circuit. Uh, last one I have for you here. <clears throat> who are some of the most interesting or a couple, two of the most interesting people who might not necessarily be golfers, but you've had the pleasure of spending time with or being around because of the game of golf? You know, that's, that's the one, one thing, you know, that another thing great about this game is, you know, when you play in the Pro-Am, there's, there's types of players, like you said, like Tiger, you know, that, you know, could have given – two sheets of wind or whatever to who he was playing with, you know, he was going to go out there and be and try and perform to, you know, his level of expectation. Nothing was going to get in his way, but I, I've always been a big fan of playing in the programs. I love to go out. And I w- love to watch people. I love to help them out. Um, I like to, you know, really encourage them. Obviously if, you know, I don't really like to talk shop because I don't really know much about insurance or cars or banking or accounting or doctors or lawyers or any, any of that stuff or whatever. So I mean, I'd like to keep it simple, keep it about the game itself. Uh, gosh, I, well, I played with Mikhail Baryshnikov one year. Really? I mean, he just, How cool yeah, would that uh, um, in AT and T and, you know, you're talking about a guy who was probably a living legend, you know, maybe the younger, younger kids these days don't know who he is, but you know, ever, people right? of the seventies yeah. and eighties. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, did, did a little bit of theater, did a, you know, did a little bit of Hollywood, um, but mostly just, you know, performing and choreography and just, you know, ar- arguably the the best of all time in his field. Right, right. You know, and to sit there and, and play, play with him at AT&T for three rounds, you know, I, I couldn't help myself. You know, I, I had to tell him, you know, my daughter, my daughter loves to dance, you know. He was he he wanted to be more like me, you know. He wanted to talk more about golf, you know. What what make what you know? How how can I hit the ball farther? You know what? How do I get the ball higher in the air? I wanted to, I wanted to be more like him, or I wanted to talk shop. <laughs> well, yeah. Anybody who is just excellent in their field, no matter. What, I mean, the best of the best, right? Like, how could you not want to soak that in for as much as you could, right? I mean, incredible. That'd be such a cool experience to spend time with him. Was his golf game fairly decent? Did he have a good natural golf swing? Uh, he did, you know, and, and he, he, he had played for a while, you know, I'm, I'm, so I'm guessing, you know, he's probably been in the game for 20 years, but he's, he's, the, he's a little guy, you know, he's five, six or seven, 125 pounds. I mean, it's just, you know, there's, he can go out and enjoy the game, but he has to, you know, obviously play from a certain distance in order to do that. And, you know, at Pebble Beach, you're playing a sloppy wet golf course at 68, 60, 67, 6,900 yards, you know, it's just. It, it, it was tough for him. You know, he couldn't reach some of the par fours and two, you know, certainly was, you know, going to have to beat, beat people with his handicap. And, but he, you know, he had kind of a, you know, a good handicap, like a 12 or something like that. But, right. you know, it, just, it was just, it was, it was going to be a very, very tough course for him to perform on. But what a cool experience. I mean, that would just be fascinating. Like that, that, that yeah. might win the, the best question or the best answer I've ever had to that question of spending three days with Barishnikov. That would be that's so cool. And then, and then the other the other person would be uh, when I was in South Africa. I met I met uh, Nelson Mandela. So 
you know, he was, he was out speaking at one of the tournaments and we had a, a president's dinner afterwards where, you know, the, had a couple representatives from, you know, um, the United States in there and they had a couple representatives from Europe. Um, and you know, they asked some people said, you know, Hey, would you like to have dinner with the, with, with the president? And some people said, no, this first opportunity they asked me, I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, mean, so, I mean, you get to go and meet, you know, and, you know, have a glass of wine with him and sit there and talk. And then he tells you about the state of, you know, South Africa, you know, where it was, where he, where he, you know, pictures are going to be. And, you know, things he's learned, you know, about his past or whatever, that he's trying to help others in the future. And, you know, he doesn't, he, you know, he wasn't a golfer, so he didn't really want to talk golf. So, but I mean, it was awesome to talk to, a, you know, a leader of a country and, you know, he, he, like every president, you know, he gets some good press, he gets some bad press, but you realize that, you know, he, he's only human, you know, he's only looking out for the, the body of people, or whatever that he's, you know, representing, you know, there was, yes, there was a lot of, adversity that he had to go, go through a lot of animosity or whatever that he had to discard. But still you sit there and you talk to him. It's like, man, what a really genuine person, you know, and he's very humble. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you feel like some of these leaders, the world's against them or whatever, and they get very, you think they're going to be very angry, you know, and very stern and like this or whatever. But he was, you know, very relaxed, very humble, you know, real nonchalant. And it's like, wow, oh, you know, just, and after you think about it, it's like, man, I just, a dinner with the president of the country. That yeah, was I mean, really cool. Well, so. not only that, it's Nelson Mandela, right? I mean, the, my God, the, the I mean, what an icon to meet. I mean, for everything he accomplished in his life and the adversity and wind up where he did. I can't believe somebody would say no to that. Christ, I would I would fly halfway around the world to, to spend twenty minutes with him. That would have been, an, I mean, an amazing experience. How cool! But those are some great answers. I mean, Bershnikov and and. Nelson Mandela. I think that one tops my list of when I've asked tour players that question. That's that's pretty good, man. That's a that's a good story over a beer to tell some some guys in a pro am of yeah you know talking about Bershnikov and sat down at a dinner <laughs> with uh, Nelson Mandela. But anyway, that's probably a seven wood for you, sir. Right? That's awesome. Well, <laughs> I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, I know you you guys' schedules are busy. Um, we're going to be watching how you're doing, and uh, I'd love to have you back on when you get that first victory and kind of do a quick recap because um, you, you showed a lot of perseverance, man. It's it's hard to get back into Q school at that level. It's um, it's uh, you got nothing but my respect. It's a uh, it's it, it's not easy to get back out there and you're playing well. All the best, and um, yeah, thanks for taking the time. I seriously really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Have a good day.